alumnos. Don Miller County and John Hopkins University, uh, students of Ivan Yates, who did amazing work, computational number theory. We will talk about the distribution of extremely values of linear recurrence, recurrences. All over M. If you'd like to join us for dinner at the usual place, let me know right after the talk. So the uh, story behind this talk was I was actually jogging in the woods in Princeton, and I bumped into uh, Aaron on the on the way, and he, he invited me to this seminar. And I have never spoken at an experimental math seminar before. I do more number theory, and, and also I teach financial math at Johns Hopkins, but. Uh, I guess now already five years ago, although it seems like yesterday, I was in uh, Doran's uh, experimental math uh, class. And that semester we covered linear recurrences, was, such as the Fibonacci numbers, was the subject of this semester. And so I revisited some of the work we did there. And, uh, and so what I'm going to talk about is uh, when we look at the Fibonacci sequence modulo some integer or modulo prime, it's a very kind of classical subject with links to number theory. We're going to uh, talk about a little bit different issue than, than the classical one, what I'm going to call extremal values, and I'll explain what that is. And we're going to link it to some problems in elementary geometry and give some basic results and then suggest some uh, possible avenues for further work. Oops. Okay, so here's our famous Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and if we look at it modulo some integer m, we get a periodic sequence. And if you look at the, the period here, so we can make some at least some experimental mm -hmm. observations. Uh, if we look at the period modulo uh, two, it's period three, and modulo five, period is twenty. We get uh, the product of three times twenty is sixty, and we, it turns out that that's in general true for products of prime powers. And if we're going to look at prime powers, we see the uh, modulo 2, it's period 3, and then it doubles for every power of 2. And for period 3, we see that it triples. We go from 8 to 24. And so the general facts, the general facts that we know, we, we go back to actually this paper by D.D. Wall in 1960. And Wall was a number theorist who uh, most spent most of his work in industry, and at the time he was working for IBM, he was doing uh, research on random number generation, and he was led to study that these kind of sequences, and he was interested in their length, which is sometimes known as the Pisano period. We're going to denote it K. And the first uh, thing that he proved, although I, I suspect it was known earlier, was that for a product of prime powers, that the period is just the least common multiple of the individual periods. More interestingly, he, looking at powers of primes, he found that if the modulo p squared and p, that those periods, if they were different, then as we observed earlier, then the, we can just say that the period of, of, uh, of a power of a prime is just uh, p to the exponent minus 1 times the original period uh, k and p. So, but, and I guess he kind of said it best, so I'll quote him directly. So he said that the most perplexing problem that we've met in this study concerned the hypothesis that the period of mod p squared doesn't equal to mod p. And so he ran a test on a digital computer which showed that it was never equal for all p up to 10,000. But he could not yet prove that it was impossible and that it's closely related to another question that can a number have x have the same order mod p and mod p squared, which in rare cases has an affirmative answer, and so you might conjecture that equality might hold for some exceptional p. And then in 1992, uh, Sun and Sun, who were actually twin brothers, uh, so they proved that such exceptional primes might lead to possible counterexamples of Fermat's last theorem, and which reminds me of a certain letter that uh, Professor Zalberger posted on his website about possible uh, <laughs> Counterexamples. I didn't realize it was an April Fool's joke when I read it. <laughs> but it's funny to read. Um, I can imagine such a referee's report. Um, but anyway, uh, it's conjectured that infinitely many such, we call these now wall sun sun primes, that they exist, but there's no known examples. 
And it turns out that people are actively looking for these primes still. Um, this prime grid project, which, which uses many, probably hundreds of computers or thousands, for all I know, uh, to look for these kind of primes and other special primes, it checked up to 10 to the 17th or 2 times 10 to the 17th without having found any so far. Perhaps they'll find one. So now let's look then to more or less reduce the problem. But one, one quick question. Yeah. How do you prove that something might be something else? <laughs> you, you, said, you said that yeah. double sun proved prove that such primes might be something. <laughs> so so they what, what yeah, so theory? so and they was, proved that if you find such a prime and probably some other conject some other condition exists, then you would oh, have okay. a it would be a counterexample. And so that not that finding a prime would be a counterexample, but it would be yeah, one fine. worth checking. So yeah, back they, back before when, when people might have reasonably looked for counterexamples. Um, so, so we've more or less reduced the problem of periods to just uh, looking at it mod modulo the primes. So I have a little table here, and another theorem that uh, that Wall proved, uh, perhaps known earlier, was that if the prime is uh, congruent to plus or minus one modulo ten then the period divides p minus 1, and if it's plus or minus 3 modulo 10, it divides 2 times p plus 1. And uh, the reason this comes up is actually that the, the, um, the characteristic polynomial of the Fibonacci recurrence has, has, has roots in the field um, q adjoins square root of 5, so it's the uh, arithmetic in this number field that kind of governs the has some governance over the period, and so whether something is a square, a uh, quadratic residue mod 5, or not, governs the period. And then we'll also see that's why 5, which ramifies in this field, is, is kind of special, and it's, it's sort of an oddball, it's not even included in this theorem, it's just here. And we notice that, it, so indeed, it, these divide these, and often they're equal, but there's some exceptions. So we have, here in the bold, we have 14 is an exception to this. And 32 is an exception. So this theorem tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything. And, and whether or not some prime has a particularly short period is it's kind of a difficult problem. We can't really say why, when that would happen or not. We don't have any, the theory doesn't have much to say about that. Occasionally, for certain big moduli, there, we can have very short periods. So um, what I want to talk about is more general sequences, Fibonacci sequences, where we have different starting values. So here is, this is the normal Fibonacci sequence, mod 5, and it's got period 20, but we can start with initial values 2 and 1, and, 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 and go like that, and then we only have a period, we get a much shorter period, a period of 4. And then uh, that is actually everything, and there's a trivial sequence, the zero sequence. Mm -hmm. So 1 plus 20 plus 4 is 25, which is 5 squared, so we've, we've covered everything. And again, uh, mod 7, we have uh, three different possible uh, sequences. They're all period 16, and so that's 48, plus one more trivial one, 49, again, 7 squared, and that's, that's everything, and we see that they have the same uh, period. Unfortunately, it's not in general true, so here's an example. This is not all the orbits, some of them. But we have these orbits that are, are period 10, uh, but we have another one here that's only period 5, so it's cut short and moved back on itself. So um, I'd like to talk a little about the, the, so the distribution of, of, these, of these things. One thing, for example, we notice that only this sequence up here is equidistributed. We have the same number of each residue, but none of the others are. And we can, in fact, this has been proven. So uh, there's been uh, a few papers back in the 70s which prove that only for powers of five that the Fibonacci sequence is uh, distributed uniformly. And the Lucas sequence, the Lucas sequence is just the Fibonacci recurrence, but we start with two and one is the initial values, that those are not, 
are not ever equally distributed. In Bambi, uh, in Nathanson, in separate papers back in 75, and Bambi was here at Rutgers and retired, I guess, a few years back, um, generalized this, this sort of test for uh, equidistribution distribution to general second order occurrences. So anyway, we know something about powers of five, and people have attempted other moduli to try to describe the distribution of them. So uh, Jacobson's done work on, on powers of two, and there's been recent work on powers of three, and uh, also uh, Sommer has worked on uh, more general powers of P, and he has some limited things to say about their, about their distribution. Um, so if I back up a little bit, so what I'm interested in is, and this was motivated by a, a, another problem we had on, uh, from uh, a number theory problem I'll mention later, was I wanted to know how close something would get to zero. So for example, well, a lot of these things have zero, so they get, that's as close as you can get. But for example, this one, with, we, you know, we have a minimum value one and max value four, so it doesn't quite get to zero. And similarly, here's, here's another one that doesn't get to zero. Oh yeah, that does. Which one doesn't? This one. <laughs> that one doesn't. Okay. And so I wanted to say something about those uh, kind of extreme values. Did you have any periods the one for? One five nine. Yeah, I that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a period with three one four one oh. five, nine, two six five? Ah, uh, well, yeah. I didn't think about that. I mean, <laughs> maybe if you can card enough. I I don't think so. Uh, maybe no. we could prove that some such a thing doesn't exist. Okay. So um, so okay. So 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 here's an example, and so we have this minimum is one and, and maximum is nine. And I kind of want to study these extreme values. And I want to do it motivated by my original application. I want to just do this kind of symmetrically. So uh, whether we can be close to zero either from the top or the bottom. So we just go around in this cycle. And so uh, we can define, actually this is, can be a metric defined on, these, on this group, uh, which is called encoding theory. They call this the V distance. It has a name. And so applied to a sequence, what I'd like to do is, so given some sequence in the integers mod m, I'll just define, I just want to know how close something gets, the closest, the closest element. So I'm just taking the minimum. And because we want to compare across different moduli, it makes sense to normalize this by dividing by the modulus. So we get something that's between 0 and 1, actually between 0 and a half. Can't be more than a half away. So for example, then, we have this periodic sequence. I would say the distance here, the minimum, what I'm going to call the minimum distance, is one-fifth. So oops, wrong. there we go. So OK, now let's consider a, like a general integral recurrence. So where these coefficients here, integers. And I want to consider um, the set of all sequences generated by any arbitrary initial terms, which are integers, and in any modulus. And so and then I'm going to define the subset of all possible minimum distances. So I'm going to consider all moduli and all initial data. And I'm going to and I'm going to ask, well, what does that set look like? And, and sometimes maybe it's convenient to look at the, the closure. Okay. And I'm going to call this, and you'll see why when you see some pictures, I'm going to call this the minimum distance spectrum. All right. So uh, let me give an example. So we have this recurrence. Uh, the, we have to take the previous term plus twice two terms ago. And we can choose, so given a modulus m, I can, if I pick starting data a and m minus a, then it just repeats in a period of two. And because here a and m are completely arbitrary, I can, I can pick any fraction I want between zero and a half. And so that I would say the spectrum is, it fills up as big as you can get between zero and a half. So that, that's a simple case. So, um, so the open problem is, 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 how, is, is how would you characterize this sort of minimum distance spectrum 
for the Fibonacci recurrence, which is just the sum of the previous two terms, or the Powell occurrence is another, uh, another uh, one on one, which is twice the previous term plus the one before. And the Powell occurrence is actually, this is the one that I'm more interested in, and it's related to arithmetic and Q adjoined the square root of 2. So, okay. So here's where the experimentation comes in. So, uh, so I checked in for the Fibonacci recurrence. So I checked all moduli up to 150, and I checked all possible starting data. Um, wasn't I wasn't as efficient computing as I could be. So I think people could easily go to a much higher modulus. But what do we see here? Is we see there's there's one. The other has a minimum distance of of a fifth, and that's this three one four. Sorry, two one three four mod five sequence, the one that's only period four. And then we have one here that's at uh, an eighth, and we appear to have a gap in between. And then we have a couple more here, and maybe some gaps. And then we have, here appears to be, it looks dense anyway, it is dense. Um, and this is artificial because this is just one over 150. So presumably this will fill out as you go through it. So that's what it, that's what it looks like. And so, Maybe the easiest thing, to, the easiest thing to ask is, well, how do we at least guarantee that this, that there's nothing above one fifth? That seems like a, a reasonable, sort of an easy place to start. So, um, so okay. So, in order to generate the Fibonacci sequence, we can we can uh, use this two by two matrix, and it generates all the terms of the Fibonacci sequence. And if we let it act on integers uh, modulo m, then what we get is we get an action on, on, on pairs of integers. It's actually a, a group automorphism. And then we can look at it geometrically. So let's take that and then, and then plot it two-dimensionally here. So, so these are, this is integers mod 5, so it wraps around. And so let's look at all of our possible orbits, mod 5. So we have, I've got the different colors. That's actually the whole purpose of the talk was <laughs> I learned how to do colors in, in Beamer. So I'm excited about this. Um, so we have the trivial one, the black one, and uh, 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 the zero one. And we've got the one that starts here is the, the normal Fibonacci starting point, And this is period 20. And it, bounces around and, and ends up back here. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this is the one that's actually short. It's only a period of four. So if that ever gets down to zero, it, it stays, it's always one away. And up here, it's one away as well. So, and if you get bored of the talk, you can, you can get out and try to do mod 13 or something in your notepad and, and, and write all this, and write these down. Um, but that fills everything out. Uh, here's, here's another example. So here's mod 8, and we have the tr one trivial orbit, and we've got, we've got uh, one of length 3 and two of length 6, and you can, there's probably a pattern to this, and, and, and four of length 12, and we've plotted them out. Although the orbits of length 12, these square ones, not all of them are the same. There's some that are come down here to zero, and some stay away, and this one is actually the red one here stays away, it never gets down to zero, it's stuck at one. So that would have minimum distance in eight. So that was when we were looking at the spectrum. So we had, we had a fifth, we had an eighth, and we had a bunch more. Well, we, we, found, we found these ones anyway, the fifth and the eighth. So that's where they come from. So, Okay, so it makes sense if we're going to consider different moduli to actually look at this a little bit different and divide through by m and consider everything just in integers modulo 1. So this is the torus. And we're going to consider uh, rational numbers in the torus and how do they, and how do they move around under the, um, this automorphism T. So, so what I'm interested in then is so we have this torus. This is the way I draw for us. And so we have to pick some rational point 
and we applied T, this automorphism, so this was, the, this particular one was this one, and if it's rational, we'll have some orbit, and I want to see how close it gets to one of the sides, it doesn't matter which one. So I want to pick out, I want to pick out a nice representative. Now, on the other hand, you could pick an irrational point. You might ask what that does. So it turns out that for an irrational point, you're just going to fill out the entire, the entire square. You get some dense set of the, set of the square. So it's, it's not so interesting for me. But in fact, most people who study these, so these kind of automorphisms are called hyperbolic toral automorphisms. And hyperbolic here means that none of their eigenvalues are equal to one. So in two dimensions, so in one, you've got two eigenvectors, and one squeezes and the other stretches. So you get some kind of mixing effect. And so you know this is kind of one of the, the basic objects in study for people that do ergodic theory, which I don't know much about. But I, the little that I know, I know that most of the work seems to be done on often looking at the irrational points. But from a number theory point of view, we're kind of more interested in the rational points and what they do. So as we start to get into this kind of more geometric picture, so this kind of repeat what I just said. So we have a, a an automorphism on the torus that acts like this, and we get this finite orbit if we pick rational pair of rational numbers. And we want something nice in the sense that close to zero or close to one. All right, so let's say I want to start with, let's say that I'd like to show that this, for the Fibonacci recurrence, so what I want to show is for an equals, well, it's for this, this particular homomorphism comes from the Fibonacci recurrence that here's four fifths, here's one fifth. I know there's one particular orbit that actually exactly is on this line, so if I consider the open set here, I want to guarantee that there's not some strange rational orbit that can sit inside there. Okay, I want to get I want to make sure that can happen that they always have something outside there. Okay. So how we might do this? So if you had say, uh, if you had an orbit that sat inside there, I'll come and call this U, this open region here. If there was an orbit inside there, then we should at least have this that, as we go from. Right? If I had an orbit inside there, then this can't be, that can't be empty. No. So, okay, so now then this, so what can we do? So we take our little box here, and I'm going to transform it by, uh, by T, when I get this other thing. And this funny shape, and then I want to wrap it around, I want to stick it back in the torus. So we get that, and you know, it looks, looks very similar. It, it is an automorphism. Uh, in fact, now we've got a homeomorphism. And I want to take the intersection. So we have the intersection here. And, uh, and we get this, this square. And we can keep going. We take an intersection again. And it gets a little bit smaller. Take an intersection again. We get something uh, a little bit smaller. And we do it one more time. Now we've only got two more regions left. And we go one more time, and last time it disappears. So this is easy. So we actually get the empty set. So that means if we have any sequence like this, actually the inverse here doesn't really matter because we're in a cyclic periodic sequence, then we guarantee that something's going to fall outside that region. So, so we can write this up in, in the language of, of, of Fibonacci sequences that, so if we have the Fibonacci recurrence and we have any starting value, 
that uh, they were eventually going to have a term that's less than one fifth of the modulus or greater than four fifths. No matter what modulus, no matter what starting value. So, in some sense, this is a very weak statement and only telling us about an extreme point and it's not pinning it down. The, the, the strength does come, any strength that's there comes from the fact that we're, we're, we're doing this for all moduli and our starting values, all starting values. So, in that sense, it's general. Um, so, any question about that? Yes? Uh, so, so you did that with your open set view. If you tried to play the same game with the close, the closure view, then mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't go to zero because there is an orbit. Yeah, you, you're going to get, so what you'll get is, what you'll see is you'll get little, what you'll actually get is you'll get little, slivers, you'll get four of them. And the reason they'll look like that is because T is squeezing in one direction and stretching in the other. Right? So that's why they're like that. So you're going to get, they'll converge to line segments, four line segments. Each one of those will have a rational slope. So the only rational point is going to be the ones, the points that you already know are in there. Oh, cool. So that's, that's what would, that's what would happen if you extended it a bit. And we're, we're going to talk a little more about that. That gets to some of the kind of open problems I'm going to think about. So here's, here's the one sequence I was, the recurrence I was more interested in. This is the, it's called the power recurrence. And well, we have one that's, we actually have a fixed point at one half comma one half. So that's as far away as you can get and it's just stuck there, it's fixed. And then it appears that everything else is below a quarter, quarter or below. And, uh, and so but we don't know like what's dense or what's only a finite number of points and so forth. Um, so we can repeat the process similarly. So we start with this region. Uh, I want to guarantee that everything is, except the exceptional point, that everything else is below a quarter or above three quarters. So knowing that there is a point here which is going to stay there. So this can't disappear. So we intersect with itself a bunch of times, and we see, well, here's four times, we get this effect of squeezing and stretching. And, um, and eventually, we can prove uh, that this actually converges to, this, to a line, which points in the direction of the eigenvector, the eigenvalue bigger than zero. And it has a rational slope, so we can say that there's only one rational point there, one half and one half. And, we can prove this ad hoc for this particular case, but actually, you can say something a bit more, more general. So, when we have a torus, so here's our torus again. And I want to, I want to, I want to draw a convex set. Convex. Well, it looks convex. Anyway, but you know, you can say, well, if you're talking to someone like a differential geometry, and so, well, isn't this the geodesic here, and that's the minimum point, and it goes outside your set, so not really, not really convex, but I want to call it convex, so I need a different definition. So what I want to say is if it's so simply connected, well, actually, I guess we need simply and path connected. And it, it lift, and it lifts, so in the universal cover, it, in, so we can do this in any dimension we want. So this would be a d-dimensional force. To, to homeomorphic copies of convex sets. So we get a whole bunch of these things, which are convex in, in R2. Then I'm going to call this convex, or I'll give it a different name, I'll say toral convex, just to either avoid or, or add more confusion. And so then I want to intersect these sets. Now, normally, when you take a two convex sets, the intersection is convex. Now, however, in this case, so we have to be a little bit cautious, this is, I guess one problem with the definition, is that you might, anyway, intersect and get more than one connected component, and that causes us difficulties. 
I want to make sure I want to make sure that this thing doesn't break into pieces. What I do know is this. 